All right, how many of you guys excited to be in God's house? Make some noise. Come on now. All right, we're in part seven, man. We've been in this series for a while called Dream to Destiny. And in this series, we're looking at the life of Joseph. It's a long series. He covers a lot of chapters in the book of, of Genesis. But here's what we want you to know if you're kind of new to the series. God has a dream for your life, meaning like he's going to try to get you that dream. He's going to give you a vision. He's going to give you a word. He's going to give you a dream. And that dream is intended to get you moving towards the destiny he has for you. But in order for you and I to fulfill the destiny that God has for us, and he does have a destiny for you, for us to fulfill it, though, he's got to prepare us for it. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen quickly. Uh, so he's got to actually take us through trials and testing to work on our character, that our character would be strong enough to support the destiny he has for it. And what we see in Joseph's life is a series of some people would call it like a battering test, man. He's just going through a lot of trials and tests, but they were intentional to actually produce something inside of him that in his character and his faith that he was being prepared to do what God had called him to do. Now, because this is part seven and we've covered 13 years of Joseph's life up to this point, let me kind of just rehash over these last six that we've done really quickly, okay? If you're new, Here's a quick catch up, okay? The first test was the pride test. And that's how do you respond? The question is, how do you respond to the dream? So God gives you a dream, you have a vision. How do you respond to that? Do you respond with pride or humility? Do you humble yourself? Do you meditate on it? Or do you boast about it? That's the pride test. The second test is the pit test. That question is, how do you respond when Satan or others attack you? Joseph is thrown into the pit by his brothers, but we know that that's a spiritual attack as well. The enemy was behind that, influencing that, uh, to try to undermine Joseph's destiny, the purpose for his life. That's the pit test everyone have to face. The palace test is how do you respond to uh, uh, or in stewardship? So when God uh, gives you resources or gives you so, do you respond in stewardship or squander it? Uh, the purity test is how you respond to the test of moral purity. Now, all these tests, by the way, you don't just take them one time and you pass them up. These tests you take all throughout your life. It's not that you pass the, moral, the, the purity test. Joseph passes it one time and never has to think about purity ever again. No, 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 that's not the way it goes. You're going to have to pass these over and over. The prison test is how you respond when you suffer wrongfully. Joseph is wrongfully accused. He did the right thing and suffered prison for it. And so you and I will have to pass this test when we're suffering for things that we didn't even do. It's called the prison test. And then there's the prophetic test. And the question there is, how do you respond to the word of God? Is the word of God going to be the standard of your life? Or is there something else that's going to create the standard of your life? Is it going to be your opinion? Is it going to be someone else's opinion? Popular opinion, culture, politics. What's setting the course and the standard of your life? That's the prophetic test. Today, is the power test. Somebody say power. power. Yeah, the power test. I don't know if you've ever known someone that got a little bit of taste of authority, a taste of power. They got a position or a promotion, and then immediately they change. Do anyone like that? Not you, though, right? Not you. Not anyone in this, in this room. Let's be, has anyone here ever failed that test, the power test? All right, those of you that ain't raising your hands right now, you're failing the lying test. That's what it is, okay? <laughs> Because there's this, it's like a human nature. Once we get it, it's like not very many people know what to do with it. I actually, a lot of my, like in the leadership classes I teach, I'll tell a lot of the leaders some of the things that I did wrong, man, and how I responded wrong when I had authority and when I, when I got power. The power test happens when you step into God's destiny for your life. This happens for Joseph when he's 30 years old. He steps into his destiny. Now remember, you don't stop taking the test. He hasn't fulfilled his destiny yet. He just is going to step, and you'll see it. We'll study it today. I've got a lot of scriptures for you today, by the way. Not enough to fit in. But he's going to step into his destiny, and he's still going to be tested and prepared for fulfilling his destiny. This is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump around a lot in the story here in Genesis 41, but I want you to understand some things about power. The power that God wants to give you, actually. Do y'all know that God wants to give you power? Do y'all know that? Okay. God wants to give you power, but then I want to show you how Joseph passed this test. There's actually three attitudes that we see in Joseph's heart and his life that helped him pass the power test. Genesis chapter 41, in your notes, it's going to start at verse 8 and up here on the screen as well. Verse 8, 
the first seven verses of Genesis chapter 41 is, is where uh, Pharaoh has this dream. So he has this dream, and Joseph interprets the dream, or we'll study it that. But it's just the dream, like the recounting of the dream. Let's look at verse 8. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So Pharaoh was troubled by the dream that he had. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer, some of your translations call him the butler. Remember, uh, this is the, the same guy that Joseph interpreted his dream for. So he was in the prison with Joseph. He interprets his dream for him. And the cupbearer goes, uh, oh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. I forgot about the guy that interpreted my dreams two years ago. I was supposed to mention him to you and get him out because he was wrongfully accused and stuff. I totally forgot. I know a guy who can actually interpret dreams, and he's in your prison right now. He's sitting there. So in verse 14, it says, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. Here's just what I want to, to share, show you in these first setup verses. It, the power test happens quickly. It's going to happen in a moment, in an instant, you, you're gonna go into, you can go into your boss's office with one position and leave your boss's office with another position, okay? When the power test comes, it happens quickly. I know you've been working for seven years towards it, and you've been trying hard, and, and, and you've been waiting long for this, but what I'm saying is, when it happens, it's gonna happen like that. It'll happen in an instant. You will go from one level to the next. You'll go from one position to the next, so you need to be prepared for the moment you step into new power, new authority. Joseph interprets his dreams, and, and which no one else can do. No other wise man, no other magician could do. Verse 41, it says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and people shouted before him, make way. Then he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. In one day, Joseph goes from the prison to the palace. And a lot of people don't understand this, but you will be tested by success. In fact, the power test can be stated like this. It's the success test. So many people fail this test of success. A lot of people can handle the pain of life, but aren't ready for the prosperity and the blessing of God. We don't handle it well. So let me say it like this. The pride test is how we handle the dream, but the power test is how we handle the destiny. The prison test is how we handle it how we respond when things go bad. But the power test is how we respond when things go good. A lot of people, they can't. We can handle the prison test. We can handle the test of adversity. But when success comes, they're not ready for it. So think about this. Let's say there's a small church, and there's this guy who volunteers in the parking lot. And he does a great job. He loves people, loves them well, serving them, parking cars, talking to the kids, guiding people along their way. Man, he's got a servant heart. And then the pastor comes up and says, man, you're so good at this. I think I'll make you a leader. You're, you're the parking lot captain. Will you, from now on, there you go. You're the parking lot captain, man. And the next Sunday, he shows up to church with a baton and a bullhorn and a flashlight like Kylo Ren's lightsaber. I mean, you know, he, he's, he's failing the power test is what's happening. Something shifted in his heart where he was once a servant hearted. Now, because he got some position, he is changing in the way he's carrying it. I don't think we handle power appropriately, the power that God gives us. And I think it's because we don't understand what power is for. Why God gives us power. What is the purpose of power, for giving us power? So I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about power. How you respond to power actually reveals the character of your life. First, we need to understand power, and then I'm going to show you how to pass the power test. So here you go. Write these down. This is, first, we need to understand power. Like we need to get, wrap our mind around it rightly. The first thing we need to know about power is this. Number one, power is from God. Okay, we, gotta, we have to understand that all power, all authority comes from God. Romans tells us that their all power and all authority comes from him. It actually says there is no power and no authority that is given except by God. Psalm 62 says it like this, verse 11. God has spoken plainly, and I've heard it many times. Look what he says. 
power, O oh God, belongs to you. You are the giver of power. This is, this is a truth that's actually revealed in the life of Jesus. There's this really cool, funny story in, in the Gospels. You may not think it's funny, but I read the Bible differently than a lot of you. I think it's funny. In John chapter 19, we see Pilate questioning Jesus. Let me show you the interaction. He says this, don't you realize I have the power either to set you free or to crucify you? Like, for, he goes, do you, don't, do you refuse, sorry, I back up. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Like, aren't you going to answer me? Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? I think that's so funny because he's talking to the creator of the universe, right? He's talking to Jesus, the creator of the universe, like, I've got the power. I'm surprised Jesus didn't chuckle right here, you know? Like, you're so cute, Pilate, standing there in your dress talking about power. Your little Roman dress and stuff, okay? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Come on, how many here want power from above? Anyone here want power from above? God has that for you. God wants to give you power. Second Timothy tells us, not in your notes, but it says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, or self-discipline. Did you know you were created in the image of an all-powerful God? You were created for dominion. You were created for authority. You were created for power. In fact, as a human, his creation, you were wired, check this out, you were wired to desire power. Okay, now, now sin and the enemy has twisted and confused that, that we desire power for selfish motives now, and that's what we see is that people don't know how to pass the power test, but inherently and originally by design, God's purpose for power was good. He told the man in the garden, you will have dominion and rule over everything. It was good that he wanted us to rule and to reign with his power. But something happened along the way that we, don't, we forgot the purpose of power. You need to know, it's not bad. It's not bad to want power, but it's our motives and our understanding of power have to be pure. You think about what Jesus said. Jesus said, if anyone desires to be great in the kingdom. He didn't say, don't desire to be great now. Hey, don't you puff up yourself. Don't you desire to do anything great for the kingdom of God? Don't you desire to do anything great for God? No, he didn't say that. He said, if anyone desires to be great, let him be the servant of all. It's not a bad thing to desire. We just need to make sure that we have our hearts pure. We need to make sure that we're, uh, our understanding is, is right about power and our motives or our attitude is right about power. The truth is, in order to live the fulfilled life that God has for you, you have to live by God's power. It, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, not in your notes, but he says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. It's a matter of power. Did you know God wants to bless you, but he does not bless self-reliant people. He blesses people that are dependent on him, that are surrendered to him. God wants to use you, but you must, you must live by his power, not yours. Ephesians 3.20 says, it is by his mighty power at work within us that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which we could ever dare ask, dream, or imagine. God wants to use you and to bless you and to empower you beyond which you can even imagine in your own mind. But we have to live by his power. We got to position ourselves for his power. Which leads to this second point here that we need to understand that not only power is from God, but power is given to the humble. Power is given to to the humble. Now I'm talking about true humility, not false humility. You ever see false humility where people can't even take a compliment? They're just like, it's all God. No, no, it's all God. Glory to God. You know what I mean? So, uh, this, remember last week I told you that um, on a Wednesday night I went to this church, visited it, tried to sit in the back, and that pastor called me out and told me to preach that following Sunday. I told that, that, that story last week, but let me tell you what happened on that Sunday. I actually preached the message, and it went really good. It went great. I mean, it was, it was a word from God. I hardly had any time to st- just wrote it out. And just, it was, people responded. There was a lot of salvations, healing, altars were full. It was fantastic, man. I was like, God is, is moving. He's in this. I get off the stage and the pastor's like, Pastor Jason, that was so good. And I said, it was all God. And he goes, calm down. It wasn't that good. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, pop, you know what I mean? Just humble that little kid just a little bit, okay? 
James 4.10, let me share with you a few verses here. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will exalt you. He will, he will give you authority. He will give you power if you humble yourself. First Peter 5 says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Oh, you want God to show you favor? Well, you got to submit yourself then. You got to humble yourself. The reason why so many people don't pass the power test is because they can't submit to power. Why would God give you more power if you can't submit to power? You're already failing the power test. Are y'all hearing me? Is this too much for you guys? Okay, you can, you're not submitting to the authority he already has in your life, the power that is in your life. You're not submitting to that. Why would God give you power if you're not acting in honor to the power he's already given you? All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. So who does God show favor to? Who's God going to give power to? It's to the humble. It's amazing to me how, how humble we can start out in our journey. When we first start out, start out with something and God blesses us with power and promotion and, and he does that because we're humble. But then after a short while, we lose our humility. It's like when we first started that job or that business or that ministry or your marriage or your parenting, you first start, you're like, God, help me out. Do you remember that? Where you're like, God, oh, oh my gosh, help me. I can't, I, can't, I can't do this, God. And then after a little while in it, you're like, oh, I know what to do now. I'm good. Relax, God. I figured it out. Okay? It's just, it, it, it's easy to get to that place, but you need to understand the lower you put yourself, the more you position yourself to be used by God. And pride is ugly, man. Isn't it ugly? Have you ever seen a prideful person, man? Have you been around a prideful person? It's repelling, isn't it? You, you're just like you don't want to be around a prideful person. I don't know if you ever like admired somebody from afar, maybe you, someone's, someone's life, their success, or maybe they were a writer or an influencer of some kind. You like reading their stuff, and, but then you got a chance to meet them and they were like arrogant and you were like, ew, you know? And then it changed, it changed how you were able to relate to that person and receive from, their, from, from them the wisdom and the content. It just Because it, it's hard to connect with that arrogance. It's, it's, re, it's repelling. But then on the other hand, have you ever met someone who's maybe successful and they've achieved stuff? Or, and then you, you kind of you meet them and you're like, they're a normal person. This is so normal, so cool. They're humble. And it's so attractive. Isn't that person who is humble and normal just attractive? You want to be around that person more i want to like give me some more man let me all buy the next book or whatever because because of their their attitude or i'll tell you what really gets me if you've ever been around a person or know a person that has not achieved or accomplished anything but is prideful anyway that irritates the snot out of me i'm telling you man and and, and then i mean you've been, you've been fired from every job bro and, and you're like, you're still, you're still going like, well, this is the way I do it. You need to stop doing it your way. Just stop, okay? First thing you need to do is take a slice of humble pie. Here, sit down. I want to say something else, but anyway. Power, power. Here, we just need to understand this. We have to understand power. Like power is from God. Power is given to the humble. But why, why? Let me give you this last understanding of power, and then we're talking about some attitudes. Power is for helping people. That's why God gives power. God gives power. He wants to give you promotion and authority so that you can help other people. Because here's what we think. Finally, when I get that position, I can fix this place up. Finally, when I get that, I can do it the way it's supposed to be done. I can do what I want to be. Listen to me. You're already failing the power test. If you've had that mentality and you're moving forward in your power and in your authority, you are failing the power test because power is not for you to get your way. It's for helping people. That's what power is for. Let's look at Acts chapter 10, 38. Jesus as our example here in this text. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And with power. Well, why did he do that? Look what he did next. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. God gives power to help people. God gives you power to heal people, to release the oppressed. That leadership position that you have, that authority that you have today, the power that you have today, it's not for you. 
It's for helping people. That is why God gave you the power in the first place. And the reality is, check this out, you're never really fully alive and living that full abundant life that Jesus has for you until you are living this way to help people. Jesus explained it like this in Mark 8, 35. If you insist on saving your life, like reserving it for yourself, it's for me and it's about me. It's for me, I'm going to get my way. If you continue to insist on that, Jesus said, you'll lose your life. If you save it, you lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. So we got to understand power. We have to understand what it's for, okay? So Joseph... Uh, was, was about to face his biggest challenge yet. And his biggest challenge, you guys, was not the pit. It wasn't, that wasn't his biggest challenge. And his biggest challenge wasn't being wrongly accused and, and going into prison. His biggest challenge was this power, success, authority, is a, is, is a much harder test I have found in people's lives than adversity. How we respond when you get a taste of authority. Why is it a harder test? You might want to write this down. It's easier to forget God in the good times than it is to remember God in the bad times. Isn't that true? When you're at the bottom of the pit, what else is there to do but cry out to God? You've already tried everything else. You're at the bottom. When, you, when, we, when we were, listen, let's talk, let's be real. When we were at the bottom of it, what else do we have to do? We're like, God, help me out. Rescue me. Help me, God. Help me. Rescue me. It's easy to cry out to God. It's easy to remember God in those bad times. But when you are blessed, when you have favor, when you have power, when you have resources, oh, how easy it is to forget how you got there and who got you there. What made Joseph so great was that despite his circumstances, Joseph never changed. His focus stayed on God regardless if he was in the pit or if he was in the palace or if he was in, in prison. But how did he do it? How did Joseph pass this test? Let me show you so you can pass the power test for yourself. It's through three attitudes that we're going to see in Joseph's life here. Okay, Three attitudes to prepare you to pass the power test. Here's the first attitude. Number one is this. I am who I am because the providence of God. Okay, we got to catch this. We need to adopt this attitude. This has got to be our attitude. I am who I am because of the providence of God, meaning this. None of us here predetermined and planned to be born in this country, did you? None of us. I, I went to Uganda just last month. Some of you have been to other countries, even to Mexico and stuff. All I can say, okay, I thank God that I was born in the United States of America, okay? I am not, uh, I, I didn't plan that. I didn't determine that. I didn't choose that. You didn't choose the family that you were going to be born into. But from the beginning of time, like ever since you were born, God was trying to get a message to you that you are who you are because of his providence. Let's pick up this story of Joseph in Genesis 41, where Pharaoh had these dreams. No one can interpret them. But upon hearing the dream, that cupbearer, he is reminded, oh yeah, Joseph, I remember. Let's continue the story in verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he quickly brought him uh, from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. So, you know, you can't go before Pharaoh dirty and, and unclean and unshaved, so he had to clean him up. But Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I had heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now look, let's time out here for a moment. This is, again, it's a pagan ruler, you guys, who does not know God and that God that he doesn't know and serve gives him a dream. He doesn't believe in him, but he gives him a dream. So God is setting the stage. This is Joseph has been in the prison for two years now, okay? And this cupbearer forgets Joseph for two years. Joseph is in this dirty dungeon. He's smelly, hairy, messed up Joseph, okay? Here's what I want you to know listen, don't give up hope. Because God is the one, you might, be, you, you might not be able to see it, but he's moving the chess pieces on the board, aligning them perfectly to get you to where he needs you to be. Don't get stuck in dungeon mentality. 
Don't get stuck in a poverty mindset, in a lack mindset. Don't get stuck thinking your time's never going to come. You better have the right attitude because when it does come and God moves the pieces together, it's going to come like that. In an instant, you're going to be brought from one season to the next season, and you need to be ready for it. I am who I am because of the providence of God. Look what he says. Joseph responds. He goes, you're the guy, right? You're the guy who can interpret dreams. And Joseph says, I can't do it. Wait a second, Joseph. Wait, wait. Joseph, are you kidding me? This is your time. This is your your shot here, man. And you're saying you can't do it. But Joseph is showing us this attitude that he has now, right? Because he knows something now. He's, he's, he understands something that a lot of people forget. The reason that he's standing there wasn't because of his abilities, but because of his God. It wasn't because of anything he's done, but everything God has done. He realized that it was God. God didn't forget him in the pit. He didn't forget him in the, in the prison, and he wasn't going to forget him or leave him now. I can't do it, but look what he says. But God will. This is an attitude that Joseph had even in his dungeon, in his prison, wrongfully accused. He had an attitude, I am who I am because of the providence of God. And if you want to prepare yourself for passing the power test, you got to have the same attitude. Here's the second attitude. I am where I am because of the promotion of God. I didn't manipulate my way to this position. I didn't kick down the doors for where I am. I am where I am because God has put me here. So Joseph interprets this dream. And he says, you can go read it, but he tells uh, Pharaoh the interpretation. He says, those seven fat cows in your dream, that represents seven years of plenty in all of the land. All of the land of Egypt and all the land across the land. It's going to be seven years of plenty. But then the seven skinny scrawny cows in your dream that's seven years of famine that's going to come after the seven years of of plenty so joseph gives pharaoh some advice on how to take those seven years of plenty and prepare for the seven years of drought that are going to be coming verse 33 he says to pharaoh now let pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of egypt let pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land let me time out right there I think it's very, uh, this shows us again his attitude that he's telling Pharaoh to appoint other leaders. See, when you understand that you didn't give yourself power, it's easy to give power away. See, this is one of the signs of a mature leader and someone who's passing the power tests. They are people who are raising others up and giving leadership away. Let me say it like this. If you're not raising people up and giving away your power, then you're failing the power test. If you're not raising people up, raising other leaders, giving leadership away, giving power away, then you are failing the power test. Joseph could have said, appoint a wise man who's going to make all the decisions. And that sounds like me. Appoint someone who's just, who's a good ruler, someone with wisdom. I think I know a guy. I think I know a guy. It's me. He could have easily had the ear of the king. He interpreted the dreams. He could have easily went that direction, but he had a different attitude. He said, take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food, like store it away. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that's going to come upon Egypt. So he says, hey, you're going to have seven years of plenty. Don't use all of it. you got to tuck a lot of that away because there's going to be seven years of famine coming. So he continues. He said, the country is not going to be ruined by the famine if you follow these orders. Joseph presents a step-by-step plan that the Egyptians could prepare for that period of time. And here's what Pharaoh's response was in verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all of his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God. This is a pagan ruler, you guys, who sees the spirit of the living God inside of this man, Joseph. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit, that's power, to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Here's what I want you to see, you guys. Joseph never suggested that he would become prime minister. Something happened, again, in Joseph's life in that pit 
Just a few years ago, he was dropping his name to the cupbearer like, hey, drop my name in. Tell him about me that I'm wrongfully accused and, and get me out of here and talk to the Pharaoh about me, 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 me. Help me, help me, help me. Here he is now, two years later, standing before the guy who has all the power and he is not manipulating him at all. He's not kicking down the door. He's not putting in his application. He's not trying to get him to see how he would be the right guy for it. He understands that he is where he is because of the promotion of God. I'm convinced that if Joseph was before Pharaoh, and if he tried to manipulate that decision, and if he tried to go, Pharaoh, by the way, I'm the guy, man. I'm the guy. I, I could do it. I could do it better than anybody. Then God would have went, whoa, you ain't ready for it. He would have took that power away and brought that test around probably another two years, okay? But something happened again in Joseph. God prepared him through previous tests and trials to respond differently to this test. He had an attitude that he understood this promotion, his, where he is. He is where he is because of the promotion of God. Look what Psalm 75 says. For promotion comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert. Listen, you're... Your promotion, your next level, you guys, it doesn't come from who you think it's coming from. It's not coming from your boss. It's not coming from that person. You don't need to get in good with them. You don't need to name drop. It's not about who you know on this earth. It's about the God that you know in heaven, okay? That's all. And Joseph recognized this. God is judge. He puts down one and he sets up another. The same God who let Joseph go to the pit is the same God who let Joseph go to the prison is the same God now that prepared Joseph for the palace and for power. 13 years up to this point of testing and trials and difficulty. But if you think about it, I mean, now he's got the ring on his finger, you guys. He's got, he's got the robe. He's got people shout, make way. Nothing happens in all of Egypt except by the word of Joseph. But 13 years... If his brothers would not have thrown him in the pit, if they wouldn't have sold him into slavery, if he didn't endure that, if he was not wrongfully accused and thrown into prison, he would have never met a cupbearer. He would have never been used by God to interpret the dream of the man who would put his name before the Pharaoh. He would never be standing before Pharaoh if he was never tested, if he never endured the trial, if he never passed the test. See, God, he wants to bless you guys. He's got a beautiful destiny. I believe it, a destiny for every single one of us. But you have to go through the process. You have to be prepared by God for what he has for you. I love what A.W. Tozer says. He says, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly without first hurting him deeply. That's such a truthful statement. I found it to be so true in my life and throughout my entire life, you guys, as I see other people who are used greatly by God. There's a process that God uses of perfecting our character, our faith, purifying us through the fire of testing and trial. How do we respond to the pain? to the trials, to the wounds. Now, every trial you go through, listen to me, every trial you go through, there is a time stamp to it. There's a time period, and it's how you respond in that test, in that time, determines if you pass the test, if you're ready to go to the next level, or if it comes back around again, and you stay two more years in the prison. Okay, there's just some attitudes. Not only do we have to understand power, but we have to have the right attitude, man, so that when we step into it, guys, and you are going to, it's going to happen. Immediately, it's going to happen. you got to have the right heart, the right understanding, the right motive, the right attitude. Here's the third one. I have what I have because of the provision of God. Everything I have is because of Him. He's given it to me. I didn't make this myself. I didn't create this myself. Everything I have has come from God. It's an attitude that helps you with the power test. Joseph is now second command in all the land of Egypt. The, the Pharaoh gives him the most beautiful woman in the land for his wife. And every one of Joseph's dream has come true. It would have been so easy for Joseph at this point to forget who he was, where he came from, how he got there. 
And that's the test of power. It's easy when you get there to forget who you are. Where God brought you from, man, the pit that you used to be in, the brokenness, the addiction, the, the hopelessness you used to be in. You get a little bit of authority and power and promotion and wealth, and then all of a sudden, you forget where you come from. You forget who you are. You don't have the right attitude to steward that power. I have what I have because of the provision of God. Now, Joseph protected himself. He had, he had this attitude. I have what I have because of the provision of God. Let me show you where I see that attitude in his life in, in verse 50 of Genesis chapter 41. It says, during this time before the arrival of the first of the famine year, so it was at the seventh year then of plenty, two sons were born to, born to Joseph. So he had two sons. I want you to see what he names them. His, you know, by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of the sun god Re of Heliopolis. Joseph named his sons, check this out, the older son Manasseh, meaning made to forget. And what he meant, his name meant that God had made it up to him for all the anguish of his youth and for the loss of his father's home. The second boy was named Ephraim, meaning fruitful. And this is why his name meant, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my slavery. He gave his sons two names, two names that we set up as a reminder to himself and to the world and to everybody that was a witness that God, but be, because I am not who I am today, where I am today, and have what I have today, but because of a God who loves me, cares for me, promoted me. He didn't allow his problems to cause him to forsake God, and he didn't allow the power that he gave him now to cause him to forget God. What I love about this in verse 51 and 52, he says two times, this statement twice, God has made me. He understood that his dreams came true not because he was a self-made man, but because he was a God-made man. Do you have any reminders set up in your life of who you are and where you come from? Do you have any reminders that, that you are who you are today because of the providence and the promotion of God? The provision of God? He, he gives his kids names that forever, for the rest of his life, when he calls his kids by name, he's reminding himself, God made me. God made me. God made me. He sets up a permanent reminder that he would never forget that he is where he is, has what he has, because of the promotion and providence of God. I don't know, you need some reminders set up in your life. One of the reminders I have is actually in this room right here. It's my prayer room, my ready room. And in that room is a picture in a frame of the first building, Discovery Starting Place. It's me sitting down in a chair teaching 16 people in a warehouse that a few of you, I'm looking out here, a few of you were, were in, okay? Uh, 105 degrees in that warehouse, unbearded, young, non-gray Jason. That's what I need to remember. That's what I need to remember. I, I can never forget that. So every time before I step onto this stage, I pass it and I remember. It's right there and I put it right there that as I pass it, I remember where I came from, where we came from, that I didn't build this, God built his church. I don't, I don't have what I have because of me. I have what I have because of God. The providence, the promotion, the blessing, the favor of God is because of you, God. What reminders do you have that are set up? Because if you don't, if you don't, you're going to get the wrong attitude. You're going to catch the wrong spirit along the way. It's easy. It's just easy. It's human nature to forget God in the good times and just remember him when it's bad. And God knows this. God knows our nature. And so as part of, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when the Israelites were going into the promised land, he gives them some warnings because he knows us and he knows our nature. He knew that they would forget that he brought them from slavery and he's the one who parted the sea and he's the one who destroyed the, the chariots. And, and he, he knew that. So he actually tells him in Deuteronomy chapter 8, hey, when you, when you get to the promised land, you're going to say in your heart, oh, it's by my power and, and, and the might of my hand that I've gained me this wealth. That's what you're going to get. God knew you're going to get to the promised land. You're going to forget, man, that it wasn't you. You're going to try to say it was your power. And it was the might of your own hand that gave you the wealth of this promised land. But he says, here's what you need to do. You need to remember 
the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as to this day. God is the one, here's what he's telling the Israelites, God is the one that gave you power to produce wealth. You ever heard that before, that God's the one who gave you power to produce? Meaning this, you have the skill sets you have because God gave you those skill sets. You have the mind, the intellect you have because God gave you the mind and the intellect you have. You have all the abilities, all, all that, all the, your working legs, the breath you breathe, okay? Everything you have, it came from God. He gave you the ability to produce what you are producing today. But there's a reason for it, and he tells the Israelites this. The reason was, so that I may establish my covenant. Here's why. Because some people ask, like, why me? Why, am I, why did God bless me? There's a lot of people that aren't blessed and I'm blessed. Why, why did God promote me? Why is... Why are my kids or my family or my business? Here's why. Listen, there's probably some, pa- there's some tests that you pass along the way, but here's why. Because God wants to bless you so that you could be a blessing. Your blessing, the power he gave you, the influence he gave you, that business he gave, whatever that was, that was for helping people. And if you use that right way, if you use the power the right way to help people, God will continue to bless you. But it's not just helping people. Here he tells us in Deuteronomy. It's not just about doing good things. It's for establishing his covenant. Not only his covenant with you, but God wants to use you as a conduit to be someone who would influence this world around you, to expand, to let people know the good news that you have, that you know. The covenant that we have of grace through Christ and in Christ. That because of your influence, your authority, your power, that you are uniquely positioned by God to be an instrument of his glory and goodness that through you, his good news will be spread. Are you seeing that, you guys? This is the purpose. I'm telling you, you're going to have to pass the power test. Some of you may, be in a, you may be in a dungeon season. You may be in the darkness, and you don't know behind the scene, the chess pieces are moving. And if you get you get stuck there in the wrong mentality in this season, when it comes, because it's going to come, man, it's going to come like that, you're not going to be ready for it. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.